All right, this is like my dream class. I got a little bit of a background on some of you, and this is a great treat for me. So I don't know who's... Actually, definitely, I'm happier to be here this morning than you are, I think. It, it's, it should be... This is great. This is, you're just the kind of people I, I, I like working with. Um, and I'm also in my favorite classroom, which allows me to use all these boards uh, at the same, if I have my markers. Great. So um, what I want to talk today about is looking at gender dimensions of nonviolence and also the gender dimensions of violence, right? Because we have to think about, and if I'm talking too fast, raise your hand and I'll immediately slow down. When I get excited, I talk fast. <laughs> so, um, but to start, just some good resources I want to draw your attention to. This is an excellent book for people interested in nonviolent resistance during armed conflict, particularly women's human rights defenders. It's called Rising Up in Response. It's, it's written by um, women who work with the Urgent Action Fund for Women's Human Rights. Do you know this group? Mm -hmm. This is a group all of you who are activists should know. This is a group that has headquarters in the U.S. and also Africa and Latin America. They give grants specifically to human rights activists. They have a 48-hour turnaround. The idea is that it's urgent response when human rights defenders are in jeopardy, when there's an issue that they've got to get money to, when there's a court case they need, when there's a protest they need, and they, they make grants and they, they turn it around in 48 hours. So these are stories and examples of what they've learned from working with these groups all over the world. And it's not just for women's rights activists, but it has to have that gender component, the equality component. So it's a good, it's, again, it's called the Urgent Action Fund. So they're they have headquarters in, in Africa and Latin America and the U.S. All right. So I hope this is an interactive session. That's why I don't use PowerPoint. <laughs> because PowerPoint, you're kind of frozen. There you are. Um, but here we're going to interact. So I'm going to start. And then my colleague, Roxanne, who has done extensive work in Colombia um, and, uh, and, and other places and is a former graduate from this course and a Fletcher student is going to talk us through um, gendered analysis and gendered breakdown of nonviolent resistance movements. So I want to start us with some questions. We're going to talk about what is gender first, but we're not going to use a dumbed down version. The dumbed down version is the UN version. <laughs> That's like two sentences, it's about your identity. We're, we're going to have a conceptual framework because we have to think a lot smarter than, than one sentence. So I want to ask some questions to start with. Why do more men get killed in armed conflict, but more women actually die? Hmm? Why do me more men get killed during armed conflict, but in the end, more women die? Significantly more women will die. Why are more men in peace negotiations? Usually over 90 to 97% of all the negotiators and the signatories on peace agreements are men. But why do women make up the bulk of non-violent non resistance movements? And why do women, yeah? Can you just type the questions maybe? It's oh, it's like a rhetorical almost. We're going to just pose these ideas. It's not like now I'm, no, Saba, what's the answer? <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> okay? We're thinking about this. Um, why are most human rights defenders and frontline human rights defenders women? The ones that you see most visibly often are women in the non-resistance. That doesn't mean the men aren't there. Why in many cases are women more visible? And why when you have national and international interventions do they often miss the human rights defenders, as you all know who are those, and the frontline activists, and in particular, the women get sidelined. So to answer those questions, you have to be able to do a gender analysis. You have to have a gender curiosity. And at the end of the day, all those answers will be very, if you don't already know them, they'll be very simple, right? So this is what we're going to look at. So we're going to start just with some big picture. Because people say, oh, gender, it's a minor thing. It's a, it's a, it's a small thing. Actually, it's not. Gender is, is influencing everything that you're all working on, right? So we know that people have different needs 
and different experiences during situations of armed conflict. And we know that two of the most important factors of this are your, your gender, not your sex, your gender and your age. And just like people who fight in wars, who are the majority of fighters in wars? Look, look at the movement in Syria. When it starts as nonviolence and you're seeing those images, what are you seeing? You're seeing a lot of women, aren't you? Once the movement moves more into armed resistance, what do you see? Men, Men right? You've got a big change going on. There's big shifts going on from that nonviolent to that violent conflict. So just like the people who are involved in conflict are not gender neutral, neither is conflict. In fact, it's really discriminatory. So let's answer our first question. Why are most men killed in war? Why are more men than women killed in war? They're combatants. OK, number one, they're, they are the vast majority of combatants. They're the ones making the war. OK, so they're the ones choosing to, to mobilize violently. What else? Is it just combatants getting killed? Is it just soldiers killing soldiers? OK, so why are more men getting killed? It's a tactic. Absolutely, it's a tactic. Why do you target men? Um, <coughs> to, to weaken the opposition to this people. Right. I mean, look, look at what's going on in any of the conflicts that, that are happening right now. Vast majority of your casualties are casualties, I meaning people being killed, are men. And a lot of them are civilians. Because you target men, because in every culture in the world, men are what? They have the power and they are considered what? Warriors. Protectors, warriors, right? The breadwinners. So if you, can, if you can target that population, you can start destabilizing those populations. So men get targeted. If you work on disappearance, both Roxanne and I work on the disappeared, usually 80 to 90% of your disappeared are men, right? Of particular age. So, so more men are getting killed, but how come more women are dying. This is all you got to have a gender analysis of this. Why are war, more men are getting killed, but more women are dying? Exactly. So the, the, she said health services are disrupted. It's one of the main reasons. So when you have a war, what's going on? What's happening? Health services are being disrupted. And what do we mean by that? For people who have lived in a conflict zone or worked in a conflict zone, what does that really mean, health services are disrupted? We could read about it. But when you're living in those areas like I've done, like a number of you have done, and you say health services are disrupted, what does that really mean? High rates of maternal mortality and infant mortality. So you have high rates of maternal and infant mortality. How come? How come all of a sudden during war, more women die in childbirth? Resource shortages, but what's also happened to your health care system? Let's stick with that for a minute. Being concentrated for the war. Some of them are being concentrated for the war effort. So I've lived in places and worked in war zones where the army has come in and just take all of the supplies. They just take all, they go through and they take all of the oxygen tubes. They take all of the particular kinds of medication. They take all the suture kits, right? So you can have a removal of those, but what else is happening? If you're a doctor, how many doctors are sticking around? War zone, a lot of times people who can get out, get out. So your healthcare professionals are gone or they're targeted. Look what's going on in Syria. Hmm? They went after the doctors, didn't they? Right? So they went after the doctors. So you lose your doctors, your nurses are out, your equipment's bad. You still, now you're getting elevated rates of women dying. You're under five mortalities, always your most vulnerable group. The, the, the raisin, they're raising in their mortality levels. What's else happening to him? What else is happening during a conflict? It's not, safe to go to the it's not safe to go to the hospital. Do you want to stay off the roads? We we've, we've did really large scale studies in Afghanistan. What's the most dangerous place to be? On the road, right? The most dangerous place to be is on those roads. They don't want to be out moving around. What else is happening? Race. There can be sexual violence in terms of when people go out. Darfur is the classic case for that, right? Really, a lot of sexual violence occurring for women in IDP camps. Inside the IDP camps or outside? Inside, inside, outside. inside and outside and outside why? The UN peacekeeping strategy had to change to address this. It's a gender analysis. Because women are going out to do what? 
pick up food? Firewood, food, water, and they're getting targeted once they leave those camps, right? What's happening with food supplies? Food supplies are interrupted. How many, of, how many of you have lived or worked in conflict zones? Raise your hands. OK, you know what the food supplies are like, right? You can all of a sudden go days. There's not very much food. Then some gets in. Prices get high. It goes like this. What's the gender component of when you have food shortages? What starts happening with men and women? The women will give the food to their children, which is why uh, the UN policies for, for wet feeding and dry feeding are you give the food cards to who? The mothers. Prior to this, uh, in the 80s in Somalia, that was the kind of classic case that happened, was that um, they were giving the food card to men as the head of households. They were going to check on the women and children who were, having, who were getting worse, worse, worse health. They found the men were eating the food. When you give the cards to women, they've learned, women will feed their children first, not necessarily the men. Is that because men don't love their children? No, of course not. But it might be preferences for feeding males, especially adult males. Why? Because I don't know. Okay, so in some cases it's building on a system in which males are privileged. Most inheritance passes through males, right? Most property is owned by males. So there's, there's an investment in those families. They have to keep their adult males alive, right? There's a priority on those adult males because they have the property. They're also, what happens when all of a sudden you're a female-headed household? You don't have your male anymore. Why are we worried about female-headed households all the time? Because they're doing so well? They're doing too much. They're more vulnerable. They're more exposed to crime. They're more exposed to violence. And they, they're, they're usually poor. They have worse food security, worse food access, less access to education, health care. So families are also making choices to try to keep their adult males alive, which means who eats less? Women, right? Even more than children, the women will eat less. So we're having more women die because why? Right? So they, what is, what's the number one killer of people in armed conflict? What do vast majority of people die from? Malnutrition. Malnutrition, which leads to, which leads to more susceptibility to disease, right? Vast majority of people are dying. It's why women are dying more. They're dying due to disease. They're, they get weakened, they're more susceptible, and they die to disease. So while more men are directly killed, targeted as combatants, and also because they're going after particular kind of activists, people who hold positions of power, people who might mobilize in the community, the damage to the infrastructure, the damage to the health systems and the social systems, in the end will kill many, many more women. right? So if you're thinking about and looking at response, those, those infrastructures, especially health, sanitation, are the key to keeping people alive, and in particular, keeping your women alive. And I'll give you, then let's move to another example, okay? I just want to make clear how gender matters. So we also have, we didn't get into it, but displacement, you've got you know, mass displacement, you've got stress, family dislocation, all of these things have a gendered component. So we could say, OK, armed conflict definitely is gendered. We're going to go through all of it today. Or actually, not today, but in the next hour. Um, but natural disasters are too. You could say, well, how is a tsunami or an earthquake gendered? Like that's, a, that's an act of God. That's an act of nature. It might be an act of nature. But it's occurring on human populations, and human populations are deeply gendered. So let's look at the tsunami, 2004 tsunami. So when we look at the death rates from the tsunami, for any of you who paid attention to the gender analysis of this, what are our, what are our female to male death rates? Just guess. Just throw out ideas. How many women died compared to how many men ratio? Okay, we have a three to one, three females to one male. Ten female. Oh, this is good. Ten females to one male. Now, let me ask you to your question. Why do you say ten to one? Because I want to 
get to hire. Okay. <laughs> All right. He's he's gonna push the extreme. All right. I mean, why why did whoever said four to four? Oh, oh, he's right. Four to one. Okay. Why did you say four to one? Just guess. <laughs> Maybe it's because um, generally the, the place where tsunami came, there were more women in a family than men. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's think about the gender dimensions of all of this. What time does the tsunami hit? Okay, early morning. Early morning, and tsunamis hit where first? The coast, right? Okay. Now, coastal areas in the early morning. Where are men? Are they like snoozing and laying, hanging out? They're, they're coastal people. What are they doing? They're out fishing, right? So many of the men were already out of the house and actually out on the boats, which just had the tsunami move under them. Who's in the, who's in the house early mornings, like I was this morning, getting my two kids ready for school? Moms, right? Mothers are in the house in the early morning doing what? cooking, getting their kids ready, getting everybody ready for the day, getting their kids ready for school. So when a tsunami hits, when those tsunamis hit, the majority of people in houses, in structures, were women with their children. The other factors had to do with um, how they dress. So if all of a sudden there's a huge amount of water and you're dressed like me but maybe with three or four more layers and you've got some kids, how well can you swim or run? Do, you, do most women have access to motorcycles and cars? So women's ability to flee was severely hampered. And this is because of gendered, gendered, how people live their lives in a gendered way. So your death ratios overall were four, women to every, to four females to every one male. And in the hardest hit areas, actually our extreme case, right? almost all the dead are female. Now. When the humanitarian agencies went in there afterwards, did they like, were they, they were not thinking smart, they're not like, let's, we've got to immediately apply gender analysis. They just said there's devastation, the fishing has been damaged, this and that and this. So let's think this through. What happens when you have a large majority of your adult female population wiped out? What happens to that in that society, in those areas? Yeah, the, the, okay, so all of a sudden, because what do these women do? What, do? what do women all over the world do? They have babies and they raise babies. So all of a sudden, you've got a whole bunch of people who take care of children gone. And you've got men who survived, who may have children who survived, who now have what? They're, oh, so they're going to get up in the morning before they fish and they're going to cook and clean and get the kids ready for school and get them out the door. <coughs> what do they need? They get a new wife, but what's happened to your population? Uh huh. So what kind of wives are they getting? Little girls, right? So you have a rise in child marriage. What happens when you have girls getting married at a young age? They don't go to school, right? Almost no child brides are going to school. Girls dropping out of school, what else is happening? Health people. Yeah, they have all kinds of complications because they're getting pregnant and having children too young, right? So we can see that even something like the tsunami where you think, oh, how is a natural disaster gendered? It can have vastly gendered implications, right? And those are just two little examples. So I said all that to, to pique your interest to say, gosh, maybe, maybe we do need to think smarter about gender. And now what I want us to do is to get our conceptual framework. All right, everybody tracking with me? Okay, good. So I love this board because, oh, this isn't the moving board. This is already taped, but that's right. OK, so we're going to do a much more sophisticated gender analysis. All right, so when we talk about gender, we have to make sure, oh, my handwriting is practically illegible, but it's just to, to, to be, make it more engaging. So if you can't read it, just look. You know, ask your neighbor. <laughs> My son is eight, and he came home with his card, and it said that his handwriting was bad. And he said, 
oh, mom, I'm feeling so sad because my card says my handwriting is bad. And I said, well, look, look at your mom's handwriting. Like, even I can't read my own handwriting. And, and I'm so smart. So, oh, yeah, you're right. That's good. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, we have to keep in mind, always, the diversity among men and women. Right? That is obvious. So when we talk about men and women, we don't, we don't think they're all the same, having the same experience. This classroom is a perfect example. You did not have the same experiences growing up. Your, your parents have different expectations of you based on your ethnicity, your religion, your class, your caste, your age, your sex, your gender, right? How, and, and importantly, gender is not some like little nugget inside of you that never changes, right? Gender is actually about, in terms of your identity, it's actually about a performance, right? You actually create and perform your gender identity every day. How you choose to dress, how you choose to act. The way you behave here would be different than the way you behave in the living room of your parents. Is Maybe not for some of us. <laughs> is different than the way you behave with your partner, your lover, your spouse. Is different than the way you behave with your work colleagues. How many of you have been posted and worked in, in, in cultures very different than your own? Raise your hand. And when you have to think about how to behave, you have to really think about what it means to be a, an acceptable, respectable man or woman in those societies. And it means you have to behave differently. So in fact, there's nothing inherently, some little kernel of truth inside of you that says, you are a man, you are a woman, this is how you behave. It, it's actually a constant performance. And if you don't perform it, it confuses people. I'll give you an example. When I was working in Mozambique uh, at the end of the war there, I was working with um, a, a population that had had a very large number of child soldiers uh, from that area. And there was a little girl, she was about six. And she was sitting on my lap, and she heard my translator, and she, she touched my face. And she asked me, what are you? And I said, well, I'm a woman like your mom. I just come from a different place, so I look a little different. But, but I'm kind of like, uh, like a mom. And, she, and, and I'm a woman. She said, and in this culture, they have fantastic hair braiding. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. Amazing things women are doing with their hair. So she looked at me and she said, if you're a woman, how come you don't do anything with your hair? <laughs> and my mom has been saying that to me for years. <laughs> right? So you, you have to, you're performing it. And it, what that means is it's fluid and it changes. All right? And this is important. This isn't just interesting sociological stuff. This is going to matter when we look at conflict and, and resistance. So of course, there's going to be a huge amount of diversity in this. And it's going to be contextually based, context-based. You're going to change, and you're going to be adaptable. You already are adaptable at changing these things. So because we're thinking of conflict, we're going to keep in mind that, that gender is a crucial factor, but that gender is being intersected with what other kind of factors? You're not just a woman, plain and simple, or just a man, plain and simple. What other things are influencing this, this performance, this fluid identity you have? Stereotypes. Okay, stereotypes, um, very true. So, stereotypes based on. Okay, societal norms based on maybe your class, your caste. What else? Your religion. Okay, class and caste would be your economic status. Yeah, your sexuality, race. your race, your ethnicity. So your language, your ability, disability. Sorry, sorry, I can't hear. Somebody, I, I heard mutter, mutter. I, your age, for sure. Okay. Yeah, and that'll be linked into... Yeah, disability. This is because you can't read it. 
don't feel bad about that. I can't see. I can hardly read it myself. Okay, so these factors are always going to intersect with gender, but gender is really a primary way in which in which societies are organized. Now, it's not just about. This is about kind of your personal identity. But gender is not just about identity. That's what the UN will have you think. Well, they actually don't believe it, but they just, in their concise way of kind of dumbing everything down, they, and I work with the UN a lot, so <laughs> I can say that, they just reduce it to identity, the roles and responsibilities of people in society, not based on your sex, based on your gender. But actually, it's more than that. This is why I like different color pens. A dark one. Yeah, there we go. It's also about, oops, that's not going to work. It's also about institutions, isn't it? It's not just about people and their bodies and their identities. Institutions are gendered. Institutions are gendered in ways that privilege certain genders and certain ideas that are associated with genders over others. It's a hierarchical system, right, in which some people have more are given, in some cases by law, more rights. So let's let's think about these institutions that are gendered. Okay, let's Oh, there you go. That's huge. So the law, and in this sense we can say inheritance. This is huge for women in situations of armed conflict. Why? Because men, men are dying and they're being disappeared. And when you as a woman don't have a right to inherit, a right to property, like in Rwanda after the genocide, you had a demographic skew that the vast majority of your population left alive was women and they had no right to own property or inherit. They had to change the constitution, but it's also this huge change of practices. Right? So inheritance is huge. Other institutions that are gendered that are marriage. going so, marriage. Yeah, marriage is huge. Ability to own your children. Who can who can own their who can who can have responsibility and and claim their own children. There's, there's, in, these institutions are going to, de, they are going to shape who lives and who dies. They're going to shape how people have access to resources or not to cope with armed conflict. This isn't just about, well, you can't inherit or not. What does it mean when you can't inherit and all of a sudden your husband's disappeared or dead? Oh, what, what is it? What does it mean when you're in a situation of armed conflict and all of a sudden your husband or your father is dead and you and your mother can't inherit? You get, you get forced off your land. You get forced out of your house. Interestingly, studies that we're doing show that our, in war zones, our most vulnerable male-headed households are in rural areas. Our most vulnerable female-headed households are in urban areas. That's because they're landless and they're getting pushed off. So totally different dimensions going on there. Okay, what other institutions? Think big. What are the big factors in conflict? Military. military. Is the military a gendered institution? <laughs> right? It has particular, I mean, this country is a great example. It takes the lion's share of resources, right? This country has bankrupt itself completely bankrupt itself on fighting wars. And there is almost no discussion about curbing that military budget. Mm -hmm. All right? Sure. Which, which, is, which is amazing, in my opinion. So the military is highly gendered, and it privileges certain kinds of people, certain ideas about who's security, right? Military and the police, too. This is huge. So in post -con in, in after the invasion, after the, the U.S. invasion of, of Iraq, and they start retraining the police, they're building up the police force. Any female police? Nope, no female police recruited. Uh, what's happening to women right after the invasion in Iraq? What do we see a spike of which we did not have before? Okay, maybe you didn't follow, so I'll answer my own question. 
We see a spike of kidnapping. We see a lot of violence against women in the streets. And we have a police, we have a, 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 we have a police force being rebuilt which is receiving no training on violence against women, which has no, which is fo not at all focused on protecting those street spaces. So at this same time, you're having drafting new constitutions, and you have a protest, a nonviolent movement, to start addressing violence against women, and who are the majority of the people who march? Men, because why? <coughs> it's actually too dangerous for the women to go out. So this, the idea of whose security matters is gendered in these institutions, right? Other key institutions, think of, think of religion. So religious institutions are gendered, and they can have a very pro-women, pro-poor approach, can't they? I mean, Reverend James is an excellent example. Right? They can be part of a movement of nonviolence that helps to, to make radical changes within the state, right? The, the uh, liberation theology in Latin America, a huge part of the movement, nonviolent movement, to overthrow those military regimes. What else? Oh, yeah, we've got the, the law, so the judiciary, good. Sure. Education systems. And government. Sure. Governance systems. And then let's think of this. And your NGOs are highly gendered. The whole humanitarian the whole humanitarian apparatus. And and what that means is that people get access, this is what we're really caring about, to different material resources. Because the gendering of these institutions will mean that people, depending on their gender and these other factors that are intersecting with it, are going to have different access to material resources, and they're going to have different access to try to survive that conflict. The more discriminated you are in those institutions, how are you going to do? You're not going to do well at all, right? You're not going to do well at all which is in part, again, why you're having more women die than men. And also the humanitarian support given during the conscious situation, which is not at all gendered. Because like in Pakistan, when the support is given, it's like they always focus on blankets or rice or such, such material, but they never focus on like sanitary pads or undergarments that are needed even in more, you know, in more numbers. Exactly. Than situation. So you so can you have, have it's, it's absolutely right. The humanitarian intervention where it's supposed to be neutral, objective, is actually really, has, it's based on a whole bunch of gendered assumptions about what the priorities are. So in Pakistan, in the earthquake, the ICRC is, is actually a group that, that does really good, I think, gender work. They, they looked at, okay, what's the, what's the national data on how many females there are to males? And what do we know about the gendered practices of these cultures? In some of these areas, there was a lot of seclusion of women. There was segregation of women. So what does that mean about how we need to build bathrooms? wash facilities. Remember, disease, number one killer. How do we have to build bathrooms, washrooms? How do we have communal space? If you don't give women and girls sanitary pads, what does that mean for them? They can't go to school. They don't go out of their houses. They constantly miss school every month. They could be out for a week, right? So, so a, it's about gendered assumptions, gendered priorities. Who, who gets the food? I'll give you another example from Somalia. It's, it's not just women, it's gendered assumptions about males. There's a group of young men in, um, in, in Somalia who were separated from their parents. So these are, these are men, men in their late, young men in their late teens, early 20s. They were living on their own in the camps. So the, the um, food distribution was given directly to them, right? And as they were being checked on, these, these young men were getting thinner and thinner and weaker and weaker, and some of them died. And they kept increasing their food ration. They didn't understand what was going on. When there was more investigation, what they found was 
They were not wet feeding. Wet feeding means you cook the food. They were giving them dry supplies. But they weren't eating it. Why? They do not know how to cook it. So they were being given food that they didn't know how to cook. They were eating it raw. It was making them sick. They couldn't digest it. And they had food, but they couldn't eat it. Right? So then they went to wet feeding a particular groups who don't know how to cook for themselves. Right? So all these, these things have a gender component. All right. Um, the other thing that we need to think about is, I'll go back to black. Where's my black? So here's our conceptual framework. We've got gender as an identity. That's what we're most familiar with. We've got gendered institutions that are influencing. They really will influence who lives and who dies. And we have symbolic. This is really important for nonviolent resistance. Because gender is also about symbolism. right? That may be the most abstract of all. What do we mean by that? OK, let's ask an example that you might know. How many of you know the, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo? OK, who, Jason, who, who is, who are, who is, what is this group? These were the predominantly women that were wives, that were grandmothers, or sisters, um, no, particularly mothers. They wanted to know where the children were, and they were taken by the regime. OK, okay. And, so and so they they are the family members, the female family members of the disappeared. And why do they have the association with the Plaza de Mayo? Um, because that's where they first marched, um, made a public appearance asking where, where are our children. Right, right. So they, so they wore signs, and they carried signs with pictures of their children. And it said, ¿Dónde, dónde estás? Where are they? How come it was only women? Very strategic. This is gender. This is about gendered symbolism. This is why a lot of the face of those nonviolent movements are going to be women. And it's like, think of, think of uh, Turkey right now and the woman in the red dress. It's all about symbolism. It was women because the motherhood is related to the woman. Motherhood, like woman symbolizes the motherhood. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and why do we care about motherhood and symbolization of motherhood? It matters, and it also is going to matter why women are targeted. Gains more sympathy, gains more respect. What's going on with the picture of this woman in the red dress in Istanbul getting hosed down with tear gas? How come that outrages people? How come people mobilized around that? How could she be a threat, this college professor in this red dress? Right? This is about symbolism. When, when the mothers and the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo go out in March, they are marching against what kind of regime? A military junta that is disappearing, killing, and torturing people. Would it have worked for a lot of young men to be out there marching? What would have happened to those young men had they gone out and marched? They would have been picked up immediately. There would have been something done to provoke them. They would go after those men. These women use, and they say, we are just trying to be good mothers and find where our children are. And the state is very hesitant to publicly attack them. They do. They disappear, some of them. But when they do attack them and push back or they, 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 they hose them down, right? It, it gets a lot of public outcry and resistance. The regime has to be very careful with that. So they're using motherhood. It's not just. In Latin America, in Sri Lanka they do it, in Chechnya they do it, in Pakistan they do it, okay? So, so women and men can embody things differently, symbolically, right? So as a, as a form of resistance, you will see women organize this way, particularly under re repressive regimes, because the men can't go out. Those men would be picked up immediately, right? So it's symbolic. That's just one example of the, of the symbolic access. Let me just make sure. 
how how else is is gender symbolic? And there's just something that popped up in my mind, and I would like to comment on it, and maybe you can relate it to symbolic uh, factor that why all the abuses are based on mother, sister, daughter. Why all the f words are related to mother, sister, and daughters? Uh -huh. This is exactly why. This is exactly related to what we're talking about. Why do you target women? Because they symbolize your own respect, your own dignity. And they symbolize the honor. Yes, the man. So that's the why when they... You want to attack men, you attack their women. Yes. It's a way to communicate to your male opponents. Mm -hmm. Because women, sancti re women culturally, sim they symbolize entire cultures. They symbolize religions. They symbolize nations. They symbolize people and societies. You want to attack those societies, you want to pollute them, you want to destroy them, you want to do what they did in the Balkans, you want to impregnate them with children from the other group, right? You, you, you attack women and women's bodies and girls and girls' bodies, and you do that to send a message. Is the message to that individual woman? No. Who's the message to? To the men that you are, because in every culture in the world, males are to be protectors. You have failed to protect your own women, right? So it's an attack against men, in many cases, through the bodies of women. That's a way to perpetuate the symbolic of weaknesses, exactly. And uh, also to present women in relation to men. She's the mother of a man, and she's a sister of a man. You, you put the woman both in conflict and non-conflict, like in relation to men. Exactly. exactly. Which is also dangerous. Exactly. And, and, and if, you look at, if you look at the use of sexual violence, which we don't want to equate all violence against women to sexual violence, let's look at the use of m male rape in the Balkans and or if you're following it in Syria. What's going on with the rape of men and boys in Syria? Who, who's perpetrating the rape? Are both sides of the party? Hmm. We have no reports of the opposition raping males. They might be, but we haven't had any reports out yet. All the reports are coming out. Which side? The army. The army. Right? What, what's going on with, it's all gendered. It's all this. How come they're raping men and boys in detention? Because they are you know, giving them the message that you are the weaker and we are the stronger. <laughs> so for that message, they are attacking them. Exactly. And when you read the testimony of the survivors, the males will say, I, I would rather be dead than have my father know this happened to me. I'm only going to report this you know, anonymously, but this is occurring. And other men who are in the detention centers are saying, boys are being brought in and raped in front of them. What's the mess? It's a message to the men. It's not a message to that boy. What's the message to the men? You can't protect your kids. You're, you're a protector, you're a total failed protector, and we can do anything we want to you. Right? You are weaker than us. You are below us. Okay? Absolutely. They challenge their masculinity. The, the Balkans, there was a, a great deal of sexual torture and castration. Right? So, again, this is symbolic, symbolically attacking. Right? So, so to just get into that, those aspects, I want to look at, how are we doing for time? I want to look at some of the, the, the gender dimensions of the kinds of violence that nonviolent resistance is going to resist against, okay? So we all know that there are um, all kinds of tools and conventions and, and rights for women, both nationally and internationally, and for men as well, of course. What I want to look at is some of the gender dimensions. We started getting into it on the, kind of, on the kind of violence and the ways in which it's targeting people based on gender and the ways in which resistance to it is also gendered. So we know the kinds of harms that, that men and women are facing, right? 
We know that those can now, many of those can now be considered war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes of genocide. We don't have to go through all of that. I'm assuming everybody's familiar with those kinds of crimes. If not, we, we can talk about it later. So, one thing I want us to think about, and it, it's important for responding to violence, is this notion, again, it's, it's helping us, giving us theoretical tools. It's the theory, Marx is right. Uh, the, the most, what is it called? I can't remember exactly the quote. I'll remember it and, and then and I'll, I'll let you know. But essentially what you need is, oh, here's the quote. There's nothing more practical than good theory. If it's, if it's not practical, it's not good theory. Get rid of it, all right? So let's, let's have some theory to help us think through. There's an understanding, and this is very often an understanding driven by a lot of kind of international thinking, that there's a continuum to the violence. That you can predict uh, what's going to happen in conflict by looking at the kinds of violence and the way particular groups are treated in that society. And you can expect it to just to, to become worse, right? And in some cases, that's true. But I want us to also think that when people are targeted, particularly for symbolic reasons, it's not about a continuum of violence. It's not just about a steady increase of what we already had, it just gets worse. It's about creating ruptures. Let me explain what that means. So for example, you can live in a society or a culture, or you can be working in a society and a culture where there's no such thing as marital rape. And domestic violence is a non-issue. So women in those situations can, can expect that they have to have sex on demand against their will and that they, they, they don't have much recourse to being beaten. The important thing to know is that in those areas, that norm will be reinforced. That woman will be encouraged by society to stay, by her own family maybe to stay. And, and, and she may even be rewarded. You, you just have to suffer with it. You, you're such a good mother. You stay in. You're doing the right thing, right? So we do see an increase in domestic violence in situations of conflict. This country is a perfect example, right? This, this country is a startling example if you look at our vets. They have the highest rate of killing their spouses and children of, of anyone in the world, of any, or sorry, of any group in this country. They have the highest suicide rate. They have the highest rate of being killed in accidents. Right? So you will see people in conflict. You will see an increase in violence. But the kind of violence, that symbolic violence, is not part of a continuum. So that woman who is in that situation is by no means prepared to be publicly raped by strangers or by child soldiers. So when the rapes are occurring in Syria against women, where are those rapes occurring? It's all strategic people. It's not people out of control. It's people under control. They're making strategic choices. Rapes of males are occurring in detention. Rapes of females are occurring where? In their homes. In their homes. When someone's raped in their home, what is that? They close the door and they lock everybody out? No. And they want the family to see. Or the other place where women are being raped is where? Publicly. They're being brought out publicly. Right? So that kind of violence is not part of a continuum. It's not part of just escalating what was already happening. It's a part of, of, an, of an attack against a particular population that is to rupture that population. Because symbolically, what does that mean for those women? How come there was so much targeting of, of, of Bosniak, of Muslim Bosnian women in the Balkans? How so there was mass rape. Why? Well, it's a shame. It it's a shame, but it's way more than a shame, isn't it? And they were carrying the, the children of the soldiers that they were. So in some cases, they held them in rape camps and raped them until they were pregnant, and they were so far in their pregnancy they couldn't get back. And they would send them back across the front lines in buses with spray paint that said, Welcome home, your Serbian sperm. <coughs> right? What do they want to have happen to those women? They could be killed in honor killings. What else? Ostracized. Ostracized because they are going after 
those families and communities, right? I mean, I can go on with more examples. It, 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 it's why you have the ruling of genocide in Srebrenica. The defense argument was, we let all the women go. It wasn't genocide. We, we killed the men and the boys, but we let the women go. And the, the successful argument by the prosecution was what? Once you killed the men and those boys, there was nowhere for the women to go. You, you stopped their ability to move on as a community. They can't remarry. They, they're not going to have more children. So in fact, yes, you did commit genocide, even though you let all the women go. Right? So, so one thing to keep in mind is we're not talking about a continuum. And it's very important as people resisting violence that you recognize the difference because when you have those ruptures, I'm giving you very clear examples, but when you have those ruptures, you're having attempts to completely disrupt that community. And your response has to be, has to be tailored to that rupture. It's not tailored to, well, we've dealt with domestic violence and rape before. The meaning of that kind of rape or sexual assault is very different. Huh? And it's going to have a very different resonance, echo, in that community. So we've talked about, we've talked about that symbolically. Um, the, the next point I want to make, so we want to say, we want to talk about ruptures. And I just have a few more points. We want to talk about sexual and reproductive harm. Okay, sexual and reproductive harm is, is when people are targeted based on their sexuality and their reproduction, reproductive functions. It's both males and females. So you have castration of males, you have mutilation, and here's another thing. I mean, I know you're all aware of this working in these situations. Detention is extremely dangerous. You want to try, if your colleagues are detained, you want to immediately, immediately try to get them out. And, and often if you don't know where they are, but you've heard they've been detained, you just start sending people to barracks or, or places where you think they, that they hold people. And you, we've done this before and we've gotten people out. You use all your contacts, they show up and they say, we know you have so-and-so here. We, we have reports that we, they saw them go in, we want them out. We know you saw, we saw so-and-so here, we need them out. De detention is extremely dangerous, right? Because detention is primarily where the torture is occurring. So, and I know a number of you have been detained. I myself have been detained. You want to get out as fast as possible. Um, so, sexual and reproductive harm, a lot of it's occurring in detention. But it, it's targeting, again, this gendered idea of who the community is, uh, what your ethnicity is, how pure you are, how you, sim how you symbolize your group. They're also going to target <coughs> mothering and fathering. Okay? This can also be used as a tool of resistance. We gave the example of the mothers, right? But they, they, they target based on going after people's children. The role of the father is to protect, right? So you might see that violence is being targeted this way. And remember, this is never about people out of control. Hmm? This is about people under control making strategic decisions. Don't think it's about people running amok. That's very rare, right? You're really looking strategic. I'm just going to add one more thing to the question that, like, uh -huh. especially in the tribal areas of Pakistan, women are used to produce more and more children so that they can be, yeah. they can be in the army. So in, in this way also, even before the conflict, the women bodies are used for accessibility. Absolutely. And we will see the same thing like if you look at, at South Sudan. So during the conflict between the North and the South, there was heavy pressure on South Sudanese, when Sudanese women, South Sudanese women, to have more and more babies to reproduce and replace all the ones that were dying. When you have women having lots of pregnancies, what do you get? You get high maternal and high infant mortality. Uh, I'm from Russia, <coughs> and in my country, uh, of course, women are not ready. And I'm a leader of the environment of women. And uh, uh, when I, with my team, stop the doors to destroy my forest, of course, I am and my friend, my <laughs> uh, have a child. Uh, but uh, 
it was a very shock for media. And about Minecraft, right name? Injuries. And about drums of my man's friend. <laughs> and we uh, have very good media after that uh, horrible uh, case. Uh, but I um, using my gender uh, for the my environmental media. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a good protection for me mm -hmm. and for my kids. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when we have a, a movement, uh, environmental movement, it's a man, it's a movement, man, man's movement, don't have a good media. Because for media, it's not so interesting that mm -hmm. it's a man. Mm -hmm. But very interesting about women, because I have a, a small child, mm -hmm. and many, many people, uh, journalists, uh, want a very interesting life story. Because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's true, and it's really good to be aware of and go ahead and manipulate your own gender. You know, I mean, this is this is a good way for. I mean, you think about the protests around Iran, when you really got a lot of international coverage was when? What happened? Filming of what? Uh huh. The, the the young woman being shot. This woman in the red dress is the same. You 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 think about how how this resonates with the media. All right. Um, we also want to talk about. Uh, I said poverty, property. Okay, we've already, we've already thought about gender dimensions of property. So when you attack men and women as, as the group attacking, you will get d different responses. So if you can kill or disappear men, you, you can throw property. You can make all kinds of problems for that community and those families. And sometimes it is individual families targeted, families of activists. Those of you who are activists know you guys you can be targeted, right? So going after property, uh, going after men and women can create all kinds of problems with property. You lose your home, you lose your land, you start getting land grabbing, you, you can't have your inheritance. Um, there's all kinds of problems that happen with that. The other thing is about going after women particularly as social capital. Social capital is, is the social relations. It's, it's probably how every single one of you got your job. It's, it's not always what you know, it's who you know. You use your networks. You use your social capital. You use your social capital. You probably used your social capital to get in this class, right? So when you start attacking people symbolically and you start creating these ruptures, you can cause all kind of havoc with social capital. And social capital, studies find, is basically what keeps people alive in IDP camps. It's actually why women have higher survival rates in those camps, in some cases, because they're very good at using their social capital, their social relations and networks to get what they need. So if you can target women in particular, you can cause all kinds of problems in that functioning of that society. Right? And then my last point is looking at um, issues around shame and exclusion. So much of the targeting will be done in a gendered way to cause people shame, to exclude them. And what you tend to have happen is these people are isolated and they tend to self-isolate. So the more, the more you can attack people based on shame, based, based on symbolic identities that causes shame and exclusion, the more you can start breaking apart the social capital. And, and groups that are attacking people figure this out. You know, many of you have dedicated your entire lives to, to overthrowing or resisting in, injustice. And you know how much energy that takes. The people you're up against, they have that much energy. And they usually have state resources, or they have a lot of resources to put into it. So this is something to really think about in your movements, because it's, it's a tactic. How do you start breaking that down? How do you start talking about that so that your, your best activists and some of your communities that are being targeted, that this doesn't work? Yeah. 
Yeah, can I just mention one other kind of rupture socially that happens is between the, the perpetrators and the victims. So like especially in these detention center type scenarios, you end up with people who are, you know, they have PTSD of all kinds of types from inducing trauma on others. So do you know of any like nonviolent strategies for managing you know, perpetrators that once the regime is overthrown, say, and they sort of have to re-enter society, especially people in, in detention centers, how, how they're kind of reintroduced in that. So are you asking people who have been subjected to violence or people who are the torturers? You know, it's really important point what he's talking about because there's been some studies, particularly of young people like children um, who had to part in Nepal, there's some really important studies, that children who were forced to torture uh, when, when, when undergoing mental health evaluations, they actually score worse than the children they tortured. So, so dealing with people who are torturers absolutely needs a response. These are not, especially young people, these are not people who say, well, they'll recover. In fact, they seem to be recovering worse than their victims. Um, so, I mean, I don't have time now to go into it, but, but that's definitely an issue and something to be, to be looked at. And there are there is work done on that. I could send it to the organizers. Some of that work. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on shame and exclusion as a way of limiting women's access to public space. Not only in the fact that often, for example, in the case of Mexico, where women are usually raped in very public places, and then the question is always, why were you there, or why were you out at that time of night? And so it's like a, it's a double. You know, you should be in your home. You shouldn't. And, and this, would, this needs a response by, by well-situated people in society to start breaking down those silences, to start, to start putting the attention where it needs to be off of, of, oh, this person, what did she do to make herself a victim? Or what did he do to make himself a victim? That's actually what the perpetrators want. They want that's why disappearance works so well. Your neighbor, your colleague at work is agitating on things. All of a sudden, they don't come. You start asking yourself, what was so-and-so doing? Did they say something? Did they go somewhere? Did they? You start policing yourself, right? You start policing yourself, and that's exactly. They don't have to police you. You've created your own prison. So to break that, right? OK, well, as women, we better not go out. We better not march. We can't go out. We can't protest. We can't be part of those movements. There needs to be a concerted effort for nonviolence resistance to start naming that what it is. They're trying to intimidate us. This woman did nothing wrong. You know, so there has to be a, 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 a strong response against that to make it the political issue it is. You have to, especially sexual violence, you've got to get it out of the private realm. You've got to get it into the public, right? You make that a public issue. Not about the victim per se, but the, the, the power dynamics that's going on, what they're trying to do with it, the, the, the politics and the power behind it. Super important. Okay. Yes. Um, most women's action historically has in fact been nonviolent. Absolutely it's been civil resistance. Yeah. Which has contributed very greatly to the development of the technique of civil resistance. But in two of the groups that I hosted yesterday, what came up is quite a considerable resistance of the fact that or or perturbation because the language in which we talk about it is from warfare, mm. and it's therefore related to the socialization of men to be warriors, the use of words like weapons and tactics, for example. And I wonder if you have anything, this was burning issue yesterday, I wonder if you have anything to contribute um, this matter. We, we have better words like methods is an actually mm -hmm. more precise methodological word, and it's not the position of a warrior preparing uh, vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But help us on the linguistic aspect of this. I mean, I, I, I think Ms. King is very right. I mean, one thing, and I can slip in and out of it to myself because I do a lot of work on armed conflict, is that we have to demilitarize our own minds. Huh? And, and militarism is the idea that a military solution or a use of force is the best solution. And, and that, and that and that when we have a militarized idea of whose security matters, it's going to lead us in one direction. If we have a more, if we have a more understanding of security in terms of human security, 
and, and a discourse that we are working very hard in our own minds and our own language to demilitarize. This is exactly what we're talking about. Because once we assume that that language, that framework, that understanding, that pathway is the right pathway, we've chosen a militaristic path. We need to demilitarize our own minds and our own language and our own actions. Um, and, and even how we, call, how we call ourselves, how we address ourselves, uh, how we think of what we're going to do. It's important to be aware of what the groups you are opposing nonviolently are doing and, and to offer alternatives. And that also means an alternative mindset and alternative language. Okay, let me have my colleague now come up. Sorry, can I, can yeah. I one? I just am concerned that, you know, despite some of these issues, that women, um, maybe we are too unselfish or something, but we allow our agenda of equality to be pushed to the background. So too many times in our non-violent participation and our violent participation, our agendas and our bodies and our gender be is used, but immediately that conflict's over, we must get back to the kitchen. And that's a challenge for us, is why can we not take that empowerment and make it translate into real equality? It's our weakness. It, it's, it's a perfect point, and, and don't ever think for one moment that they'll deal with gender issues after they deal after they after they move to power. That never happens. You better organize as women and as men who support the rights of women to make sure that that's on the agenda from the beginning. If you don't get it in the beginning, you get it in the middle. Don't ever let it out of your sight because comparative studies around the world show that if they say, "Don't worry, we'll, we'll we will address women's issues," it's just not on the table yet. Uh uh, don't fall for it for a second. Push and push and push. The ANC women's movement, I know we have someone from South Africa here, was very strong on that. Don't ever take your eye off the ball on that one. So you're absolutely right. Those issues, if they're part of your platform, they've got to be strong and you've got to keep pushing and pushing them. I, I do work with non state armed groups. <laughs> I was working with the Maoists. As they were entering the peace process, the Maoists had a very kind of progressive platform for women. They got to the peace negotiations, it just fell to the bottom. And the women inside the Maoists were saying, what's going to happen? What do we see? And I said, look around the world. You see your sisters around the world. They didn't get it. You better really organize. So they started really, really trying to organize. But you're 100% you're right. Great. Thank you, Diane. Um, my name is Roxanne Cristali, and I'm actually a student of Diane's at the Fletcher School. And I'm an alumna of FSI two years ago. So it's a real privilege to be here. And I'm holding onto my phone here. I'm on the sixth year of not wearing a watch, despite my every professor telling me to do that. So if you see me looking at my phone, I'm not bored or texting. I'm just trying to keep track of time. I also promise this is my only slide, because it's one of my very favorite quotes on the value of a gender analysis, which is exactly what Diane just walked us through. And it's by Cynthia Enlow, who, if I'm correct, was Diane's PhD advisor. And she says, gender analysis is a skill. It's not a passing fancy. It's not a way to be polite. It's not something one picks up casually on the run. One doesn't acquire the capacity to do useful gender analysis simply because one is modern, loves women, believes in equality, or has daughters. One has to learn how to do it, practice doing it, be candidly reflective about one's shortcomings, try again. And to me, that reads strikingly similar to civil resistance. That's one of the things that we hammer home here is that civil resistance is learned and taught and practiced. So what I hope to do during this portion of the presentation is to apply the gender analysis framework that Diane introduced to the nonviolent action framework that you're working within today. And before I do that, I do want to caution against gender essentialism. A lot of the talk about gender and nonviolence, which in people's minds is often the talk about women and nonviolence, as though the words are synonymous, is about women being inherently peaceful, being natural peacemakers, being naturally nonviolent. And I think I'd like to be careful about that. Um, a lot of my own research is on women militants, women involved in violent <coughs> resistance of their own. A lot of my colleagues work on women suicide bombers, women who command battalions. And so it's not that women are naturally peaceful, and that's why we're talking about gender and nonviolence. Rather, I'm going to look at how gender roles and expectations manifest in nonviolent movements, 
how women and men strategically conform to them, fulfill those expectations, and how they strategically deviate from them, violate them, manipulate them, as, as Diane said before. So the first thing I'd like to say about that is that gender may matter to varying extents in nonviolent movements. For some movements, it's a question of participation. As Jack said on the first day, one of the emergent properties of civil resistance is representation. And so to that extent, gender can be about inclusivity, participation of men and women. In other movements, gender is on the agenda. That was Diane's final point. Either during the movement or after, and really if it's not on during the movement, it's not going to make it on after. And what that basically means is that how gender is negotiated as a power dynamic, as a power structure, is part of the issue that the movement is seeking to tackle. And in yet other movements, especially the movements that Ms. King here has been part of, it is about gender. The system of oppression that the movement is setting itself up against or is in conversation with is a gender-based system of oppression. So gender can exist at the core of the movement, at the heart of the movement, being what drives it. It can be an issue of the movement, or it can be about participation, about who is part of the movement. And for people like me, this is not something very easy to accept. But it is important to recognize that for some participants in the movement, there may be apathy with regard to gender. You may hear, this is not about gender. This is not about women. One of the challenges with a gender-based agenda, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that we've seen in Egypt and in Sudan, is that women in particular are being told, don't hijack this, or wait till later, or let's get X, Y, Z, and then we'll get to gender. So when we are thinking about gender within movements, there's often this perception of competition, that if we focus on gender, we're missing all these other things, or our focus on gender is coming at the expense of all these other things. And dispelling that perception is very important for the movement's success. So pointing out that gender is a lens that will help you analyze all these other dynamics in the ways that Diane talked about, as opposed to something that we're focusing on at the expense of race, men, class, nationalism, fill in the blank with whatever the movement is about, is really, really important. The next point that I'd like to make is that gender is more powerful when we examine what Diane described as its intersectionality. So one of the complaints that I've seen recurrently in my research with women who participate in nonviolent resistance movements is that they don't want to be told that this is your issue because you are a woman. People don't just want to be appealed to on the basis of their gender exclusively. As Diane said, women and men are really broad categories, and we need to break them down and see how they intersect with other types of vulnerability or privilege to see how that's most useful. And that is really critical in the forming a movement stage. So it's not enough to talk about recruiting women or engaging women. Which women are we talking about? Young women organize differently and relate differently to each other than older women. Women in rural areas organize differently than women in urban areas. Sometimes you see organization around professions. So I did a project on femicide, the targeted killing of women in rural Mexico, and women are organized around journalism. So it was a professional association of women. Women journalists came together on the basis of that. It could be on the basis of religion. It's religious groups of women that are using that religious framework to organize themselves around their gender. And I'll give you a couple of examples. And so we need to stop thinking about gender, about men and women as monolithic general categories that have analytical value and start asking ourselves, which women are we recruiting? Which men are we recruiting? And who are the allies here that um, we can bring together? Are there any questions so far? Um, Make sure everybody understands the term essentialism. Yes, that's a great point. So gender essentialism, and Diane can correct me if I'm wrong, is essentially the idea that there are characteristics inherent within your gender. You know, you are born a woman, therefore you are peaceful. You are born a man, therefore you are violent. And so I'm cautioning against that idea and trying to look at how both women and men can behave violently and nonviolently. 
And so once we've thought about forming of movement and thought about which women and which men are we appealing to and who are the allies of the opposite gender that we can recruit on that agenda, who are the men we can get talking about sexual violence, who are the women we can talk talking, advocating for the rape of men or against the rape of men, we need to think about gender expectations in a nonviolent movement. And that has to do with the performativity aspect that Diane talked about before. So gender expectations matter because women and men strategically conform to them in nonviolent movements or strategically violate them. So that's the acts of commission, acts of omission framework that um, Hardy often talks about. So I'll start with how women strategically conform to gender expectations in nonviolent movement, essentially to show that gender tactics really matter in nonviolence, and also to point out some of the dangers of that. So who here knows the group Damas de Blanco in Cuba? What do they do? Um, they are um, wives and mothers of uh, political prisoners mm -hmm. who are released now, but they go in prison in 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, they march every Sunday. And they are well wearing the white gloves and they are marching with the uh, flower. That's exactly right. They are wives of jailed political prisoners. Notice the gender targeting there, right? The jailed political prisoners are men, and the wives are left to actually be able to do the lobbying and the nonviolence. They wear white, and they go to church in white clothes, hence Damas de Blanco, and then walk around town in silence. It is a quintessentially nonviolent tactic. Why does it work? For the same reason that the example that Diane brought up in Argentina of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo work, because their perceived power is less than their actual power. They're not threatening. They're women in white. They're moms. Yeah. yeah but they're really, really often beaten up and mm -hmm. works in a sense, but there's a huge violence against them, and they're more able to be able to That's an it. excellent point, and that's actually my sixth point. Can you tell I'm neurotic? Um, I actually have a point about what happens when there is violence against women who are acting themselves nonviolently. So that's an excellent point, and I'm going to hold on to that. So essentially what happens is that those women have a type of access and can penetrate the repression in ways that their male counterparts cannot. Same with the mothers. One of the challenges here, however, is that these women's nonviolence is defined in association to men and with reference to their domestic role, their familial role. And so if what they're also seeking is a change in the power dynamics in that community in the post-civil uh, resistance agenda, that can be very difficult because it's those very dynamics that they're leveraging and that system of male and female interaction and power, and that can be very difficult to unseat in the post-revolutionary era. And so it's interesting that there's this tension between a gender tactic that serves nonviolence very well that may end up not serving women's or men's particular issues after nonviolence in particular. Another way in which conforming to gender expectations works, conforming to traditional conceptions of women, is to mobilize men. And I'm going to read a quote by Asma Mahfouz. Who knows who she is? You want to tell us about her? Uh, yeah, Asma Mahfouz is uh, one of the Egyptian activists. She was from the uh, 6th uh, April movement, but that's not so important. Uh, she was basically the girl, uh, very active, who on 25th of January uh, 2011 in Egypt, and I mean, I just made an interview, that's why I'm talking, like referring to her words, how it was felt. Uh, she felt that, you know, there are people in Tunisia and uh, they are on the streets and they topple the dictator and why Egyptians are not doing. So she was very not sure about what she was doing, so she just took a mobile phone or anything and recorded herself on the video and told like, if Egyptians went to street, if the Tunisians went to street, why don't we go to street? Uh, and for everybody who stay at home, it's more or less a sign that you support the regime. Excellent. So she made this, all the people come, and a lot of people uh, like came to the street. And like if you later would maybe let talk, because I talked to her a year after, and it was really hard for her to continue her fight in Egypt, because she was a girl. Absolutely. And if you will allow me just quickly to read something that she said, because 
the way that she recruited people to the streets was in a very gendered way, and that's the gender tactics of nonviolence. So the quote reads, if you men have any honor and dignity as men, come and protect me and other girls in protest. If that is not leveraging gender dynamics, I don't know what is. And it did work for the purposes of the movement. It did get the men out there. And she was not the only one. Um, I was in Cairo during the um, revolution, and you would see women saying, are you going to leave your sister out there by herself? But again, that's the tension that I'm highlighting, that it perpetuates this dynamic of honor and protection. And it can be very difficult to dethrone that in the post-revolutionary era. So um, the second way that tactics are very gendered is by threats to subvert traditional gender roles, by basically threatening people that if you don't do X, Y, Z, or if you do X, Y, Z, I will do something that deviates from the expectations of how gender, and particularly femininity, is performed in this context. And we're seeing a lot more of that. It takes various forms. Um, Althea mentioned yesterday that you talked about the sex strike threat in Kenya where women threatened to go on sex strikes if men did not attempt to resolve particular issues on the agenda in 2009. We've seen that in a number of contexts. There are also the very well-known threats to strip in cultures where women's nudity is considered shameful. Liberia is an example of that, where basically women are using their body and threats to bear their body, which that society finds very intimidating, as a way to move men, usually, who have the power to affect action. Yeah. Sorry, your, your, your construction of the sentence is not quite right uh, Tell me. culturally. For a woman to uh, strip is to cause shame on the other person. It doesn't make you shame. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. I apologize if I made it come through the opposite way. That's exactly what I'm um, trying to get at. Now, what is interesting here is thinking about the ways in which these tactics can backfire. I know that you talk a lot about backfiring in nonviolent movements. So one thing we want to look at is whether that leads to forced sex, particularly in societies in which marital rape is not a crime. So we need to be thinking women can go on a sex strike, but is that really effective if men will attempt to have sex with them anyway, despite their will? I'm not advocating against the tactic, I'm just asking you to consider the unintended consequences that may emerge from it. Or another way in which it can backfire, which we've seen happen in some movements, unfortunately Sudan is one such case, is labeling all women as out of control. They need to be controlled better, they, or dismissing them altogether as crazy or whatnot. So it's interesting how these tactics can be effective in certain contexts or lead to the dismissal of women in other contexts. My last point is going to be what happens when there's violence, to hit exactly your question. And that plays out differently within the movement and outside the movement. When there's violence by the state, by the people the movement positions themselves against, against women, what we basically have happening is what Diane described. It drives up the cost of oppression. It is a symbolic representation of a red line being crossed <laughs> if there is still such a thing happening right now. So essentially, the asymmetry between the state and the movement becomes very, very pronounced. But the other side of that is the movement discipline becomes really important. It becomes really important for the movement to protect its nonviolent character with relation to gender. And that's why you see, even in nonviolent movements that later became violent, an attempt for the protesters to protect the nonviolent character of their movement. So in Libya, once the accusations came up, there was mass rape by Gaddafi forces. The rebels, before becoming violent, which was very quick, made sure to say, that's not us. We are not doing that. In Syria, as Diane said, opposition groups try very hard to differentiate between violence, gender-based violence, by the state against protesters and by protesters against fellow protesters. Cairo is a perfect example where uh, protesters tried to ensure there was no sexual harassment of women participating in the protests in order to make that a safe space for them. So in that sense, movement discipline becomes really important. Um, when I was a participant, Hardy said, legitimacy is the currency of the movement. And essentially preventing gender-based violence within the movement is a way of protecting its legitimacy. One note that I would like to caution against, though, 
is that when the state is violent, especially against women, it can hurt the nonviolence movement because that is one of the motivations cited for both women and men to join armed groups. So Diane has a book chapter on why women join armed resistance, militant non-state armed groups. And one of the factors women cite is they themselves having been victims of state-based violence and them needing protection or having this perception that I'll be safer if I join the guerrilla. Now that perception is not necessarily true and there's a lot of research on violence within these armed groups. And then for men as well, that failed expectation of masculinity, that failed sense of they raped my sister and I couldn't do anything about it, is also consistently cited as a reason to cite to join armed resistance. So if you are yourselves acting nonviolently or organizing nonviolently, you need to think about that. It's how do you keep people nonviolent when gender-based violence itself is very often a motivation to join. And now truly my last point, I promise, is about narrative and memory which is another of the topics that I study. And here we ask, who's telling the story of the movement? Which narratives are being elevated and prioritized? And which narratives are being omitted? And now with social media, we increasingly have women being able to tell stories and enter realms that were previously inaccessible to them, because they can tweet from their living rooms, or they can be connected to activists that they couldn't previously be in conversation with. But what's very interesting here is taking a look at the narrative obligations that we impose on these particular women. So in the spring of 2010, I worked on a project with women involved in nonviolent resistance in Egypt. And it was all qualitative interviews, and the data was split down half, with half of them saying, please stop asking me how do you feel as a woman in nonviolent resistance, and half of them wanting to talk about that gender element of it. So think about what are we projecting onto these women and men regarding their gendered participation? Are we basically setting an expectation that they will be the female face of nonviolence? Are we basically saying that is important to you, regardless of whether it's important to you or not? Or are we carving out room for them to tell their own story? And essentially that leads into how can we be allies of nonviolence in a gendered way, which may look really different than our performing nonviolently ourselves. So I recently completed a project in Pakistan, and the things that the women in Pakistan themselves could say about gender and nonviolence would be entirely discredited if I, as a foreign, Greek, Western-educated woman, said in the same context. So one of the female counterparts said, the best thing you can do is say nothing. And yet in other contexts, being the outsider, being the ally, gives you more room. There are things that you can say that your local allies cannot. So think about how, particularly on the topic of gender, your gender, your race, your class, your identity can expand or limit the ways in which you can be an ally. And I'm happy to answer any questions after. Thank you very much. Supposedly, I would like then probably to respond to this, my question. Uh, throughout the presentation, this has been coming to my mind, and it's a little bit disturbing. Uh, is it wrong, or can it be considered a gender issue or crime when a woman takes up the name of a man after marriage? And if the answer is yes, what nonviolent strategy can we use to change the status quo? Uh, do I think it's a problem if women take men's names? After marriage. Uh, no. I think it's like if that's what they want to do, they can do that. I mean, um, my children are from a culture where no, no one has a last name. They're Ethiopian. So, so I think I think it's a cultural context. It's a choice. I don't have my partner's last name. My my sister has her husband's last name. I, I, I guess I don't understand what, what is the, what do you think the problem is? I mean, I know it has a lot to do with inheritance and it can be a very patriarchal structure. Um, but to me, with the kind of issues we're dealing with that, maybe it's meaning more to you? What is it meaning more? Well, it, it, it means more because it has to do with land issues. It also has to do with the pride of the woman, that at least she has a man and, and she can be called by that man's name. So in certain societies, you can try to break the structure and the fabric when we remove these aspects. 
And maybe women also may want some kind of independence to say that, well, we shouldn't get married to a man and then have his name. That means being uh, subjected to them in some way. And in the course of our gender struggle, maybe those are one of the things that we would like to remove. And so if we want to remove that in society, how do we do that in a way that is non-violent? Okay, I have some, yes, so in the English-speaking world, and of course the British Empire, the sun never set on the British Empire. <laughs> Under Henry VIII, a doctrine of coverture evolved, in which a woman upon marriage almost ceases to exist in the eyes of the law. She becomes the man. It, it speaks for her, and in every way, has power and control for her. And of course, Christian missionaries in many instances helped to spread this tradition of the change of name upon marriage. It's, it's an issue with profound meaning, if you know the history. It's very interesting that you raise it. It's a little bit to do too much to talk about here, but very interesting. Yeah. Well, and I think the questions you're raising are about access to property, inheritance, ability to represent yourself in, in court, courts of law, to be recognized, to be recognized as an individual, <coughs> individual rights. And those are huge issues. I don't know that, I, and I think that they may kind of be represented by this notion of having a name. In the places I work, it would be, it would be represented in East Africa uh, by being paid bride price. Are you officially married, traditionally married, doesn't matter what your name is, but this bride price makes all the difference in your right. Those issues are absolutely central. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there on that, I understand. Can you just mention that last week there was a, a case that was heard in the Turkish Supreme Court about this? It was actually one of my colleagues, a political scientist, a woman who got married nine years ago. And um, the Turkish government was telling her that she had to take her husband's last name. And she just won the case in, in the Supreme Court saying that now in Turkey it is not mandatory that a woman take her husband's last name. It's up to her, right? So, and I think that that's, it, it's sort of up to every country to decide what's appropriate. But in the United States, certainly it's now typical for married women to not take their spouse's last names or to hyphenate it or come up with all sorts of things. It's just when it's mandatory, I think, is when it's... And I think that the, the fact that it represents so much more. I mean, it represents the fact, as as you're both saying, that you're you're not an you're not an individual with legal rights for yourself. Can I just speak to yeah. Erica? Um, yeah, Erica, it's really interesting you raise that because. Um, Turkey is basically a Muslim country, right. although they're currently going through various uh, battles to decide whether they want to be secular or Islamic. But actually, in the Muslim tradition, the woman keeps her own name, her own surname. That's non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. It's not a case of whether she wants her husband's name or not. She retains her name. And I think that this is something um, that's interesting, it's worth noting, because uh, often outside commentators remark on how badly women of, often are treated within the Islamic traditions, but it's often the way um, male patriarchal systems uh, interpret these laws. But uh, an actual fact, if, the, if you go to the, act, the way that the law should be applied, a woman retains her name, and also all her property, any property that she has, or wealth, uh, remains hers. Even when she marries, she's not. That's not to be shared with her husband. That all remains hers to decide how she wants to to deal with that wealth, or if it's at her leisure or disposal, if she wants to share that with her husband. So her name and her wealth and her property rights all remain intact um, after marriage. So, yeah, I think that's really something worth um, worth mentioning. Well, I have to close the session now. I'm sorry. Um, I think both, both yeah, of you, can you join us for coffee in sure. the Rougar Cafe? Uh, I think there's, got, there's a lot more questions than we're going to have. And lunch, and <laughs> Yeah, just, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're going to get as much of them as we can. Uh, thank you.